Hello, uh, welcome back to Sterling Armory Sword Talk. Uh, I believe this is yeah, episode four of Sterling Armory Sword Talk. And uh, if you're not familiar with our Sword Talk series, uh, it's basically a podcast type format where we talk about all things sword related from, uh, you know, all of us as makers of swords, uh, the types of blades we make, uh, the different types of swords that are out there from, you know, stage combat to sparring blades, to cutting blades, to HEMA topics, uh, and, and uh, all over the place. So <laughs> just a general sword talk discussion. And today's topic should be quite fun. Our, our first three topics that we've went through uh, were more focused on, you know, movies and films and, and things that I think every, the whole audience can identify with. Uh, you know, I think we all grew up watching, you know, sword movies and that's how we're all interested in, in swords in the first place. Uh, today's topic is a bit different. It's looking more on the maker's side of things and, and things that we do from a maker's point of view. Uh, so hopefully that keeps the rest of the audience engaged who aren't makers, um, but hopefully you're interested in, and we have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Uh, so, uh, before we go any further, uh, let's bring uh, the team on. So today, uh, quick introductions. Uh, Colton, you want to start off? Yeah, um, so I'm Colton of Copperthorn Customs. Um, been making swords on and off for, I, I say a different number every time. I honestly don't know. <laughs> Depends on what a you count. Time. Um, yep. Been making swords for a while. And that's it. Probably about 10 years, years give or take. (laughs) Yep. 10 something. Um, I've been moving more into the realm of the uh, good steels, good uh, techniques, all that kind of stuff. Learning all the ways. I've been a machinist and welder for, I don't know, 15 years, give or take. Um, And just always love doing this stuff. So just just here making swords and talking about it. (laughs) Awesome. That's the way to do it. <laughs> uh, Thomas, <laughs> quick intro. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm Thomas. Uh, I've been working with Chris now for five or six years, give or take. Um, I got started doing Renaissance festivals and I met Chris through that. And he was willing to show me how to do this and uh, been doing it ever since. Um, I don't have a standalone uh, brand yet. Uh, I'm still learning a lot of things before I get to that point. But uh, hopefully one day. Yeah. Or, you know, Sterling Armory. That's fine. Yeah. Or just keep, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Chris. Uh, uh, I always forget what I say, too, what it was. Oh, I... Uh, <laughs> sword maker uh, for Sterling Armory for a long time. Uh, also aerospace engineer and martial artist. And I try to bring all the different various aspects of uh, the sword world from my background into the swords that I make. Uh, and yeah, we're just a bunch of nerds uh, who like to drink mead and other drinks and, and make blades. So there's a couple of folks who couldn't join us tonight. Uh, Josh uh, Von Warbear is out today. Chet, uh, who came up with tonight's topic, uh, is uh, sadly couldn't make it. Um, and one day we'll get Brandon on. <laughs> so, But uh, Brandon is busy and, and uh, he's up in Gainesville, so we don't get a chance to see him that often. Um, but... Uh, before we go any further from here, I think uh, drinks time, right? So, what are we drinking tonight? Uh, you want? I can go first because yeah, let's I hear it. The, the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I did have for that you guys who don't know, uh, this stuff is the best, and they only make it once a year in November, <laughs> and they ship it, and that's it. So, if you can find it like um, mid November to mid December, buy every bottle of it because it's the best <laughs> drink ever. And I usually stock up on as many bottles as I can, and that's actually my last one. <laughs> so I found it. I thought I was out and uh, drinking from my nice uh, work cup here. <laughs> so. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Thomas? As for myself, uh, I've decided that I'm going to be drinking... Uh, let's see if I can get it to... There we go. Just nice, good old-fashioned bourbon. Uh, because I don't have anything else on my shelf right now, oh, so um, <laughs> too fast. <laughs> that's fine. I'm already on my second glass. <laughs> fine. Drink it this fast. is fine. Drink it fast. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. So I have got a nice little rum and cranberry mix today. Because again, my shelf is also pretty bare. I would like to have mead with me one of these times. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Someday. So for those. Uh, watching uh so thomas and i are in florida and then colton uh and chet is also here in florida 
and then Colton and Josh are in Utah. And uh, Colton was telling us, actually, if you want to tell us, like, I guess uh, it's, it's tough to get mead in Utah. Well, it, I mean, you just got to go to state liquor stores, and there's usually one per city, maybe. Like, yeah. it's you got to make a little trek in. You can't just go around the corner and grab something. Um, we can get beers here, but now that's a, like in grocery stores. We could get beers here up to like maybe 5%, I think. Anything wow. other than that, any wine, all of that's just in a liquor store. So, wow, got to go make yeah. it to the store. <laughs> yeah. So I can yeah. go literally, well, how many blocks? It's not, well, for my old house, it was three blocks away from this. It's house, probably not even a further. full mile, though. <laughs> yeah. And I can get everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and actually, Thomas, you're closer to it now than I am. With that little one hmm. across from Walmart there. Oh, it's yeah. No, I'm, I'm right next to it. It's actually where I got this bottle, by the way. Nice. Um, you stole it from Thomas. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, tonight's topic, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is a little bit more uh, focused on uh, the work side of uh, making blades. And uh, so um, hopefully it'll capture the rest of the audience's uh, attention and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Um, but it's a little different than what we've done before. Um, but again, the Sword Talk. We're going to cover all sorts of topics, uh, and hopefully this is an ongoing thing. Uh, right now, we're doing it every other week, and uh, yeah, if it gets popular enough, we might do it every week, but we'll see. I think uh, our guys might be like, no, it's too busy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but So the topic of today was brought to us by Chet, um, and uh, because it was his topic and he couldn't make it, we'll actually read his list at the end, um, but his topic... And this question for us all was, uh, what are your favorite uh, sword making techniques that either you don't do now or or have not been able to do yet? Did I, did I word that right? Oh, I think close Maybe. enough. <laughs> close enough. <laughs> I um, knew what you were talking about. Yes. Yeah, so it's basically things that we would like to do in our sword making that we're not able to do right now. Uh, I think is probably the better way to say it. Um, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Yeah, and what's cool about this topic, and and I think you heard all of us earlier with introductions, uh, although we're not hearing Chet and Josh, but everybody on the Sterling Armory uh, group all has various different backgrounds, which is great. So because we all came from different backgrounds, we all have different things we want to work on, and we also approach making slightly differently. Uh, so if you're following our How It's Made series, we're going to talk about a lot of the stuff that we're showing in that video, and then things that we wish we could either add to it or maybe do a little differently um so yeah uh you guys ready to dive into the numbers yeah so how, how do we want to start uh i want to do colton thomas me or me thomas i don't know however you have thomas doesn't matter whoever's up top <laughs> uh so yeah. uh order list it is colton okay, okay. and we're we, can i pause you there and we have yeah. our top three by the way so we picked our top three uh and then uh we're gonna go round robin it uh all of us say our threes, all of us say our twos, and then all of us say our ones, and then we'll go over Chet's list as well. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Right. So, I mean, mine is, I mean, I don't know, but I might say like kind of one of your most basic back to roots, just forging a blade. Um, I would love to just an actual fire furnace, billows, pumping it up. I want a hammer and I want to forge out a blade. Um, all the modern forging is awesome and I'm not yeah. saying that I could like make a blade that would be even half as good as what I'm doing <laughs> material wise <laughs> right. but just for just to do it at least once and I'd love to continue it and I don't know how often I'd do them really but to have the capability and to just forge a blade old school hammer anvil fire like I would just love to Love to do that. And I've done a couple little like knife blades, a couple little horseshoes, maybe like horseshoe knives um, just many years ago. Uh, and it's super interesting. I love I love doing it. I don't have any equipment big enough to do this. Um, so I don't know how you guys I, I feel like, Chris, you've said you've done this before at some point, And I'd like I to hear yet. what I'd like to hear what you're saying or what you have to say about this topic um yeah thomas what, 
Yeah, or like I, I, I don't working. know where your background is on this either. But uh, I've never actually done one myself. I've okay. wanted to, but um, like you're saying too, just uh, and it's a talking point. Chris brings up a lot, especially when we're talking to other people. You know, it's it's a real popular question when we tell people mm -hmm. that we're sword makers. One of the first questions is like, "Oh, you forge your own blades." Well, the reality is, just machine forging is just so much better yeah. uh, than hand forging. But there is there is definitely a market and um, I guess a kind of like nice to know that you can do it and it's fun exactly those things to have yeah yeah so, so oh, i'm sorry Cole. no go ahead i'd love to hear like what so you, yeah I, I started input. hand forging <laughs> uh I, I was uh i was dating a girl uh junior high to high school and this is how i got into making uh and her grandfather was a master knife maker uh, up hmm. in tallahassee uh, Edgar Chatton, I, I hope he's still around. I haven't heard from him in a while, um, but he was kind of very well known for making tomahawks. He used to write for Blade magazine as well back in the 80s. And um, yeah, he taught me. I mean, I, I would go up there for weeks at a time in the summer and start learning how to forge out blades. And um, I did it for the longest time. Uh, when it, It's great for knives. And, and it's definitely an art form, no matter what you're making. Uh, yeah. If you do want to forge a blade, you're doing it for the art. You're not necessarily doing it for a better blade. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the engineer side in me <laughs> uh, and the material science in me uh, is really why. And, and sadly, Thomas, when he came on, I was already mostly done forging. Like, mm -hmm. I, I just I don't do it anymore because it, it, it sadly, I, I'm not good enough to make it a superior product. And when I forge something, and when 99% of makers forge something, they actually make the steel a little bit inferior. And I know that might be a controversial thing to say, <laughs> but it is scientific. Uh, so, you know, a human can't forge 5160 or 1075 better than the factory that it came from. So anytime we heat it up to, uh, you know, to red hot and start moving it, you're, you're messing with the, the internal structure of the metal. And it's now no longer uniform as it was, you know, when it came from the factory. So for that's why I switched to sword making, uh, heat treat and grind because you, you get a more consistent product that you can make a lot faster, and it ends up being a lot stronger. Uh, or I can't really say stronger. It's a lot more uh, robust uh, of an end product line um, because you're not messing with the steel itself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely yeah, an so art form. It's extremely fun. I think that's, yeah, that's, that's the angle I'm coming at this with. I honestly don't think I'm interested in like making and selling these, like, but I would like for me, I would love to hang one on my wall, be like, yeah. I made everything on that sword. Start but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so to add to that, um, smelting the steel is, is a whole nother. Oh, it would be amazing. Yeah. I would love to get so, into that too, but <laughs> yeah. So if we could, uh, I'll see if I can, uh, Talk to the guys who run the, the yearly hammer and uh, over at BKS Ultimate hmm. Resort. Um, I'll see if we can all try to get out there because they they have guys doing all these processes there for like it's a two to three day event. Oh, and wow. like you'll have a, a couple guys over here smelting their own iron out of a massive you know kiln that they build. You'll have other guys forging with a hammer and coal. You have other guys on the propane forge. You have guys on the power hammer. And it's just everybody kind of showing and learning and mm. it's a really great experience for everybody so yeah that think, sounds awesome yeah, yeah sure. i think of all of us i'm the only one i think who's been thomas you haven't been to that right nope yeah i don't think josh went either mm. uh, we get to meet uh, again a lot of everyone there is awesome a lot of good folks up there and uh yeah so if you want to learn any of that that's that's the place to be oh i would <laughs> i would love to learn i'd love the science behind it i'd love to yeah. physically do it and get better at it and just try it yeah. out sometime yeah and now um slight i don't want to say correction but so when, when i mentioned earlier you can't forge a, a piece of steel and make it better than it came from the factory that's talking about mono steel i'm not talking about damascus or anything like that because that's a whole other art sure. in itself sure that can make blades far better depending on what you're doing yes so. and damascus is awesome but that's not really what i'm after so yeah that's a whole different world in <laughs> it's itself. a whole different world i'm gonna stay away from that for the moment yeah. maybe we'll maybe we'll visit that world so very cool looking it's very fun i have tried that yeah no it looks awesome but 
<laughs> that does just seem yep <laughs> we'll oh, yeah, try sure. it someday yeah absolutely we'll make it a big project right we'll do a mini series on chris watching us burn down a house trying to force something <laughs> <laughs> you know you never know but yeah you know i used to you can get you can go to yours thomas um but yeah i used to uh I started forging my first several things I forged were spears uh, and then short swords and then a big old long sword. And uh, when I was like 14, 15 years old, so that was fun. Cool. So, uh, so I, I saw this, but I wasn't quite sure what you meant. So yeah, no, it's, it's um, just, we, we primarily deal in 5160 for the blade steel and I uh, just learning to use different metals that we, we have. Um, I'd love to smaller stainless for small knives and such. Um, seeing how, because I know you've said it before too, stainless is is a different monster to deal with when it comes to to blades and such. And then also, like we have the aluminums, we I haven't had a chance to actually play with making blades and such out of it myself. But um, again, I've seen the things you've made and just how, like from a distance, even even up close, if you don't know what you're looking at, you know they look completely normal uh, in terms of like a uh, blade that could pass by by anyone yet yeah. lighter, cheaper, easier to make. And just wanting to learn how all the different types of metals that can be used in sword making, just kind of see, uh, what, what techniques can carry over, what things you have to do a little bit different. Um, you know, things like that. It's kind of where this statement comes from. Right. Um, like I know with the aluminums, like, you know, they're easier to grind. Sure. But they also just, uh, gum up a belt so you have to do extra little steps <laughs> there um so things like that is kind of where it comes from um and then obviously the kind of blades that i can make out of that yeah i don't know if i told you i actually have an order of 10 aluminum blades i gotta get done so if you can <laughs> that might be a good chance for all right cool so i'm gonna come over in. and just perfect opportunity there right there yeah. Yeah. all right gonna scratch this off the list i've got to come up with yeah. a number well, three the other cool thing uh so i've actually also wanted to, to dive into some more stainlesses too uh, I think for those of you who know us and have talked to us at Renaissance fairs or at uh, any of the tournaments or like Combat Con, we talk about, you know, we're all from, you know, well, Thomas and I are from Florida. And, you know, if we sneeze on something here, it rusts. So <laughs> we we use stainless steel a lot for our guards and pommels and stuff. Um, there are some stainlesses that are great for blades, though. Uh, probably not great for big blades, like long swords. Um, but for shorter blades or daggers, uh, there's a lot of stainless steels um, that that are great. Um, they would probably perform just as good as 5160, if not better. Um, so it would be cool. Uh, I actually have a, I was thinking about it earlier as I was cooking uh, chicken on the grill. Uh, it'd be fun to have like a kitchen, you know, like a big old knife that looks like a, a sword. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. would. As you're in, you know, in your That's kitchen. That's kind of where the idea comes from, right? Like, yeah. Uh, That'd be cool. Do kitchen it. stuff. Right. Or for the grill, you know, your grill sword. Everybody needs a grill sword, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, totally. That'd be awesome. You definitely want that out of stainless, so you're not constantly, you know, cleaning it. Um, right. The cool thing with stainless is, too, is, and luckily our local heat treat uh, company does do this, is some of the stainlesses require a cryo treat instead of a heat treat. Hmm. And uh, so it's a bit different. It's very expensive. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it provides a really good product. So. And that's that's kind of what it goes back to it's like uh you know cryo treating um you know i've heard of it before but it's neat knowing that certain stainlesses require that for for heat treating uh so it's you know it's cool things like that when you get into different metal types yeah yeah there's uh science of steels man it's come a, a real long way um you know coming from the aerospace industry i can see it all which is great um like a lot of specialty stainless steels that are very springy you know were designed for you know aircraft landing gears and things like that whereas you know sometimes they're aluminum but sometimes they needed steel mm. and uh there's uh a, there's a vast array of steels that you know sadly i think the community as a whole and in general the, the common misconception is stainless steels are bad well yeah if you <laughs> the stainless steels used by the Wallhanger sword market are bad. Yeah, that, that statement is true. Um, but stainless steel in general, it's, it's not bad. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, there's a reason why scalpels and razors are made out of stainless, right? Uh, yep. Those yep. things get, can get very hard and very sharp. So, 
Cool. Cool. Uh, I actually thought when he's when you mentioned this, I thought you were talking about guard and pommel. I did and, too. And I actually, did. <laughs> that's I, mean, what I thought it was. It, the, in fairness, that's there, uh, right? Yeah. Um, sure. To a degree, but uh, it, it covers a wide range of different things. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so. Right, so Alrighty. next is Chris. Oh, excuse me. I just swallowed my drink <laughs> <laughs> on accident. Ooh. Uh, so custom contact wheels. Um, I have to thank the guys at BKS, uh, especially Matt uh, Stagmer um, uh, and then Kerry. But they showed me a variety of custom contact wheels that they use. Uh, so for an example, I actually had some show and tell. Um, so this is a current blade. Uh, that I'm working on and ha has a big center fuller in it. Uh, currently, so this, I don't know if I can get close up here. So you can see the center fuller is ground horizontally. So I have a small contact wheel running horizontal. That small contact wheel is a normal wheel. Um, but I have to run it horizontally, whereas everything else I'm grinding vertically. And so <laughs> it's a pain in the neck. So basically, because it's the grain is run differently on the grinder, you have to bring this down to almost mirror polish so that way you can blend it back in vertically with everything else. And that's just due to the contact wheels reason. Uh, but uh, Matt showed me that they have some custom contact wheels where they can actually grind this vertically because the contact wheel isn't squared off, it's round. And even though your sanding belt is flat, um, it, you know, if you put enough pressure on it, it actually deforms the sanding belt around the, the round, uh, <laughs> around the round, I can talk. So it deforms the belt over the round contact wheel yeah. and it grinds into fuller vertically. And I was like, hmm. oh my gosh, that's that's the best thing ever. Like, <laughs> can I have one now? <laughs> and uh, they're not off the shelf though. You can't, you have to get them custom made. And um, I have tried and every time I try to get one, it, it just doesn't work out. So I've never actually been able to get one in, in my own shop. And it's very frustrating because I would love to have them. So if you're watching and you make custom contact wheels, <laughs> please let us know. All right. Um, I've actually reached out to several vendors and I've given them drawings. I've given them all sorts of things and I just can't get them. Um, so Matt or Carrie, hey, if, if you're watching, please let us know uh, where you get them from. I, I think Matt told me and I just completely forgot. Um, the other idea is, is you can actually buy a, a standard wheel and then custom grind off the rubber and round it off yourself. Um, and I thought about doing that, but then I couldn't find one narrow enough to do that with. Um, but yeah, custom contact wheels could definitely open up a whole loads of possibilities. Um, right. Oh, the other thing with, with these, so I got a couple of them here. This is essentially the same type of piece, but a much bigger version. Um, but that's as narrow as a, of a fuller as I can go. Uh, can you see that? That one's all yeah. rusty. Let me grab the other one. <laughs> see, Florida. I just ground that an hour ago. And it's already rusted. <laughs> um, so this one, again, this is the same contact wheel. Uh, I think let's focus on my face. Focus on this. There we go. That's as narrow as, as a fuller as I can do. Uh, whereas if, with the custom contact wheels, um, you can get fullers down to a quarter inch, like almost like you're milling it in. So I, I, this is as narrow of, of a fuller I can do grinding uh, at the moment. Uh, you can do narrow ones of milling. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice to be able to grind a narrow fuller right in there. I mean, you can also use, uh, angle grinders to grind in narrow grooves and we've done that and that's, that's easy too. Um, but you know, being able to work on, on the, on the big grinders instead of having to hold a, a grinding wheel is, is, you know, much nicer. So yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Custom contact wheels. I don't know if you guys have seen those before. Um, I've not. Yeah. It's, this is kind of like my part. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, most of yours, when I look at it, I'm just like looking at your list and just like, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so if we do go to the hammer in, which hopefully we get a chance to do, um, there, you'll see a bunch of them there because they have them and, and they'll be actually be showing people how to grind with them and stuff. Okay. It's pretty neat. They do wear out very quickly though. Right. Cause if you think yeah, about your contact sense. wheel, you know, we wear out normal ones quickly and it's a square wheel. So, now that you have a round you know, wheel that you're deforming the belt around, that wears it out very quickly. Hmm. So when you figure out how to order them, you better order a couple. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm going through this pretty quick, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, I better catch up. Yeah. Uh, is that, uh, are we to number two? Uh, yes, we are. Oh, no. 
No. That is it. Oh no, it's gone. The last that bottle. The last, uh, until November. It didn't That's even it. save so, me a sip. Okay, wait. How many of that. how many of those did you get in November? Because yeah. I think it's only March, man. Put a few so, boxes. We have a Ren Fair that runs uh, through November. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we went through <laughs> four to five bottles a weekend. Yeah. Awesome. And that's uh, if not at more. least two to three a day. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And then I had a bunch saved that I've gone through. So. Yeah. So, yeah. It's really it's good. good stuff. Must be good yeah. stuff. Oh, it okay. absolutely is. Yeah. Casting All cards. Right. So, so this was on my list, parts. but I took it off because I saw it was on your list. Yes. <laughs> Um, so again, this is like a little, same as my last one. I've dabbled in a little bit of forging, um, casting. I've done a little bit of casting. Wasn't super successful with it. Um, I did like aluminum and brass. Ooh, uh, was, you picked hard ones. <laughs> I picked hard ones. You did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, they were just burning up and trying to get, mm -hmm. anyways, it was, it was a struggle. Um, I would love to cast some stuff. I mean, like, cause I specifically, I don't know when I, when I thought of this, uh, the Witcher double wolf head sword came to mind. I'm like, that's mm -hmm. a really cool pommel. I'm not gonna sit there and carve that out of steel. No, <laughs> not gonna happen. So Unless if I ever like want, five grand for it. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it'd be ridiculous. Um, I would love to be able to do some kind of animal, maybe ornate. Like I don't know exactly what I would make first, but I have a lot of things in the back of my mind that I'd love to cast. Um, yeah. so at some point in time when I can get set up with something, I, I, I don't know. I just, I'm just going to have to make the room and figure out how to do it. Cause it's just, it's not hard. Um, it's not hard, uh, but let me change my statement there. <laughs> if you're casting bronze, it's not hard. Okay. Uh, other metals like aluminum and brass. Yeah. That they burn up. So it's very hard to mm -hmm. do those. Yes. Um, yeah. There's easy ways to do seals too. Um, I've casted bronze before. I think that's the only thing I've casted. And I, again, it was on my list because I, I don't have the, the capability of doing that right now. Um, but yeah, casting bronze parts. I mean, uh, we so Josh does a lot of bronze hilts at the moment. Mm -hmm. and I've done some before, but they're not casted at the moment. But when you cast a part, you can get a whole lot more detail. Yeah. Um, it's like arms and armor uh, up in uh, Minneapolis. Um, they have they're able to cast parts directly off the original uh pieces from the oakshot collection and then they remake them i mean that's amazing <laughs> so um when you're casting steel you, you got to make sure you're doing it right though um, yeah bronze is a little more straightforward steels uh, depending on the steel you, you know if you get a lot of inclusions or if you get mm -hmm. a lot of air pockets you can create a very brittle part if you're not doing it right yeah and uh, so I'm, I'm always hesitant, like when I, when I know that folks are casting guards, especially. I'm always a little hesitant, like, hey, did, did hmm. you after the casting, did you go back and heat treat it? Like, <laughs> did you relax it out? Did you make sure the guard is good? Because you don't want a brittle hand guard, right? Yeah, um, right. But yeah, most folks who are doing it do it right. Um, I, th I believe yeah. Albion cast all their hilt parts as well. And they've hmm. been doing it for a while and they do a very good job of it. In fact, I, I'm going to show one of those a little later. Cool. Um, actually, I can show it now. <laughs> yeah, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, so <laughs> this is uh, an Albion Kingmaker that I grabbed at Combat Con last year. Yeah, and I'm, I actually have this for a different reason I'm going to talk about later. But uh, but yeah, the guard is cast. And you see it's a pretty thin cross-section, but they do these guards very well. The pommel is also cast as well. Um, hmm. These are cast steel. I be, Actually, I'm not sure if the um, bean block is cast or not. Uh, I don't know. I have to ask him that. But yeah, the guards and pommels, they're, they're, they're wax, lost wax cast, I believe. Uh, Mike, if you're watching, you can correct me. Um, but I believe <laughs> they, they cast them and then also take them through a heat treat process um, to make sure that they're stable. Uh, I believe that's the case. Um, I know however they're doing it, they're doing a great job and they're strong as heck. So, so yeah. Um, whereas I've, I've had some other castings before out of steel. And they snap like pot metal. So yeah. you just got to be careful. Yeah. So Imagine the capabilities though, right? Yeah, I know. Right, yeah. It kind of opens up just a whole new world of Tony whatever you could make. It's just yeah. essentially <laughs> whatever you can carve out Imagine, of wax, yeah. you can make it. So it's like, 
it's or awesome possibilities. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you could just three D print it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three D print the wax, and then there's a, that's becoming pretty popular. I, yeah, I'm a. I got nothing in that realm. The the three D design stuff and the computery things. I'm just like, mm, I've not <laughs> ventured that direction at all. So that's right. I'd be better oh, off with just yeah yeah. We'll have Josh do it. He could do it. Yeah, right, so yeah Josh we'll have him do it all for us. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I'll just I'm describe at, uh, to him. Yeah, I'm good at geometrics. I mean, I have to my one of my normal jobs in aerospace is I have to do 3D modeling and hmm. uh, mechanical design of parts. But it's, you know, mechanical parts. They're, it's not freeform design like Josh can do. Right. Um, so I'm good at geometric shapes. <laughs> so sure. I, but I'm not good at freeform. No, that like, that uh, organic stuff, just yeah. animals and trees yeah. all that stuff i'm just like oh my gosh that is that is such an art form that i don't yeah. have so yeah a bit Same. of a struggle on that <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah i had I um have too. in fact uh one thing i wanted to do a while ago my personal sword is right here my point there yeah yeah uh -huh. and the center of the so sword has a normal round wheel pommel and okay. the center is a, a a coin with a lion's rampant line in it cool. but it's very hard to see from here right that just looks like a normal sword from here Right. My original okay. idea was actually to have it as a scent stopper pommel with cast uh, bronze lions on the side. So the rampant lion awesome. is actually cast off the side. Okay. And I actually, I was able, it took me a very long time, but I designed them in AutoCAD, which is not a freeform 3D tool at all, but I did no. design them in AutoCAD. Yeah. <laughs> and they looked good, but I could not find anyone to help me cast them. And uh, hmm. at the time I was already not able to do my bronze i didn't have my bronze casting setup anymore so i couldn't do it myself and so i changed the design to that so and in the cool. after thinking about it for a while i actually like that better because comfort wise like the way i designed them sure. grabbing like if your hands slipped down to those lines that would not be comfortable very much yeah. like the witcher blades like if you oh, grab yeah. a witcher pommel you're probably going to stab yourself in the hand very <laughs> possibly so, Looks cool, Geralt doesn't not care. practical. No, <laughs> he doesn't care at all. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. Yeah, casting. no, that's good. So Let's I, move on. Yeah, yeah I, a lot of us had casting on our list. So when we yeah. saw the list, we're like, uh oh, we, we gotta <laughs> take, you know, make sure not everyone's overlapping. All right. So, um, so mine is the next one, more even edge work. Um, more accurate just as edge work in general. Yeah, I wasn't um, sure what you meant by that one either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The you can really take out the, the even. It, it's more of just like uh, technique and getting uh, an edge on uh, the edge geometry on blades. Just it's something I need more practice on. I've only made two sharps, I think. Yeah, uh, no, working with you. They were good. Um, yeah, they were all right. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I definitely want to uh, try. You know, try some different styles, different techniques. Because um, yeah. what we do right now is. We've got that one variable machine that we use and we just set it kind of a little bit lower with a, um, a belt and uh, just kind of take it back horizontally uh, mm -hmm. back and forth to kind of even out the edge on it and just kind of learning different ways to do it. Other than that, um, that one works, but because we're only doing small sections at a time, it's, you know, it takes a lot of patience to make sure we're even all the way down the blade. Steady hands. Yeah. So, so when I was so for those watching, I actually filmed uh, because I'm not over in Utah with uh, Josh and Colton. I actually filmed myself doing um, a sharpening of one of our blades, so that way they could see it and they they can start sharpening their blades in the same fashion. Yeah, because uh, I think Josh was a little nervous about sharpening it, and if you're not careful with it, you can easily burn your edge. And what, when we say burn your edge, what that is is you can overheat the steel. Uh, beyond its its uh, limit, and you start seeing it change colors, and you lose your heat treat on the edge at that point. Um, so that's what we call burn your edge. And so you have to be very careful. Um, so I filmed the process, but in the middle of filming that process, I'm like, I'm looking at it like, you know, I'm doing this all by hand, but I'm guessing a lot of the guys watching, like our guys here, are like, that would be so much easier with a fixture. <laughs> so <All right. laughs> why don't you just fixture it? And then sharpen it that way. It would, you know, because I, I don't know why I just do everything by hand, but it would be easier with a fixture. I just haven't got around to building one. 
So. Yeah, that's pretty much our MO for any time the word oh, fixture yeah. comes up. It's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, this would be easier with a fixture. Yeah, well, it's like, that would require me to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I could spend a day making a fixture, or I could spend a day making a cross card. What, you know, you what do I get to do? Like, yeah. <laughs> I got to do the fun stuff, not the exactly. fixture. Yeah. But yeah, we, we do, the way we hand sharpen our stuff, it's all by hand. Uh, so you will see, it's not perfectly even like a machine, because... Or we're not machines, um, but you know it's it's pretty close. I, I will say it's far straighter than the original historical pieces I've studied in museums. <laughs> Fair enough. And that's the important. Man, part. those things are not straight at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, in fact, my worst one that I've done, you know, years ago was still probably better than what I saw in museum pieces. Hmm. So, um, yeah, like it's it's interesting. This, you know, and that's a common question we get. When, you know. First thing is, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, are these hand forged? And sometimes if we don't want to spend a half hour talking about it. We'll smile and nod and say, well, they're handmade, uh, you know, but not trying to start a whole conversation about it because right. it's going forever. Um, you know, same thing with sharpening. Like some folks will look at a sharp blade and be like, oh, you know, like I can see there's a little tiny wave in the edge uh, that's almost indistinguishable. Um, but if you look very closely, you could see it and, you know, I, I, yeah, I get it. Um, it's not perfect. I get it. Um, and you know, if you have a problem with that, okay. Um, but <laughs> if you go to a museum and pick up an original piece, especially one that's supposed to be for a king or a prince, that's supposed to be a pristine piece. And you look down that edge or you look down the flats, they are their uh, their idea of quality was very different <laughs> than ours is today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it's stuff. And, and again, for those watching, um, I don't know if we actually don't cover sharpening in the how it's made video. We just cover the general how it's made of the piece. Um, but when we sharpen our stuff, uh, we usually do apple seed edges on ours because most people are backyard cutting, right? So they're they're either cutting branches or. Who knows what they're cutting, but we don't want our edge to chip or roll or take damage. And uh, if somebody specifically says they're cutting tatami mats and they want a real fine razor edge, you know, then then we can do that. But they know that don't go out and cut a tree branch with that because <laughs> it's it's going to get damaged. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of science and, and thoughts behind edge geometries and and how to make them. So yeah, okay. Thomas, we can. We could do a that whole might video even be a video. Honestly. I was going to say that might be a video idea. Just going to yep. edge geometry there you edge go. types. Yeah, because I'm yep. sure there's plenty of people watching. You said apple seed uh, edge. They're just like that makes no sense. Was cut an apple seed. <laughs> yeah, so, don't... Forth. so the papers I was using to show you guys the different edges. I don't mm -hmm. right. I use them to, to test the, the edge. <laughs> out. I don't have them. <laughs> nice. uh, but uh, but yeah, no. So like that's a topic all on its own. Like you said, that we can definitely yeah. we could spend quite a long time just talking about. Um, and that kind of goes back into this is like learning the different edge styles and how to best um, do the work to, to make that, you know, maybe forcing ourselves trying to make that fixture just to say that we did it could even be part of like uh, the how it's made videos eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And the cool thing too is very dependent on blade type. Uh, right. Like very dependent. Um, so like katanas and stuff usually have uh more acute flatter angles and they don't have apple seed edges although some, a lot of originals do have apple seed edges and the thought is is what an apple seed is is it's not an acute point but it kind of rounds out to an edge more like a, an axe edge and the thought is is they're they are that way because you know resharpening and resharpening and resharpening like the more you resharpen something the more apple seed it gets and so that's the thought but historically they I, I believe they think, at least all the Toyama Ryu classes and stuff that I've been in, their swords, they do have Niku. They call it Niku, by the way. So the amount of curvature towards the edge is called mm. Niku in Japanese terms. They do have some Niku, okay. but it's very minimal uh, for the most part. Gotcha. So, cool. That's really neat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can really cool. go off the deep I end. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> so. All righty. Another video. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we'll write that one down. So uh, next, so, <laughs> there we go. Uh, oh, was that me? Chris, yep. Oh, so we talked about 3D printing a little bit earlier. Uh, but so this one's for me. So the other reason why I brought the Albion out, I would love to have a CNC machine. So my original number two was casting. <laughs> and then I saw other folks had it. So I wanted to take casting out, put something else in. 
So we don't have CNC machines, uh, even though, yeah, I work with them in my normal job in aerospace and I've tried to go into work and say, Hey, can I put this in this CNC machine? And they're like, Chris, that's a sword part. What are you doing? <laughs> so, so it hasn't worked out so well. Um, but I would love to have my own CNC machine, uh, to be able to, uh, crank out, you know, uh, either rough out blades or guards, palm, anything would be fantastic. Um, so the Albion blades here, like example of what you can do with CNC, you know, I, I picked, like I mentioned, I picked this one up at combat con and this, this particular blade I wanted because actually, I don't know if you can tell this blade was CNC, but can you get in there? Can you see the, the edge or the cross section geometry of that blade? Yeah. 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 We can kind of see that. So we would call it hollow ground because it's not a flat diamond. It actually hollows out in the flats, but they did that all in their CNC machine. Um, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I believe, uh, so basically the CNC there blanks out, uh, and then they go through and, and hand grind and polish the, you know, the, the, the edge, uh, geometry on it. Uh, and then, you know, the overall surface, excuse me, surf, <laughs> surface, and I had way too much to drink, right? Um, so they, they do hand finish everything, but the original blade blank is CNC'd out. If, if you watch our house made videos, um, you know, we hand grind all of our blanks. It does take time, um, but it would be nice while the CNC machine is running, we can just do something else. Um, so CNC would be fantastic. We don't have it. I don't know if that's ever in our site. I think, honestly, if I did have a CNC, I would probably use it more for guards and pommels than I would for blades. Um, and, and even handle parts, uh, it'd be awesome. Yeah. 3D printing now, one, the reason the, it's a little different than what we talked about earlier uh, in the aerospace world. And I, and there are some, there used to be, a, I think they, I don't know if they're still in, in production or not, but there used to be a place called Printed Armory where you could actually get printed 3D printed guards and pommels out of stainless steel. And it was a good steel. Um, so 3D printing of metals that are good enough um, structurally for sword parts, uh, is a pretty new thing. Um, I, well, printed armory has been doing it probably for about <laughs> five, six, seven years now. Um, but to get a stable part 3d printed, um, is becoming more and more of a, of a reality. And so just like we were talking about casting and sculpting earlier, uh, 3d printing will probably replace that right in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, so the problem, so in aerospace, the problem is uh, aerospace is very tightly controlled. So that's my normal background. It's very tightly controlled by standards, uh, <coughs> FAA standards or, or standards flow down from engineering societies. And the problem with 3d printing is now you're creating an entirely new material, even though it's supposed to be a certain stainless steel because it's 3d printed. It's not that same stainless steel. It's a whole different new material. So creating the standards and getting all the processes to get consistent materials is very expensive. So it's, it's getting developed and eventually will be there. So, I, I mean, I'm assuming in, like, in about probably five to 10 years, we'll be able to go online. Like currently you can go online, submit your 3D model and get a plastic part, no problem. Um, you, you can spend a lot of money to get a metal part, but that metal part is probably not gonna be good. Um, whereas in five to 10 years, it'll be probably pretty cheap to 3D print your own designs out of a crazy steel. Well, so eventually, like, yeah, it'd be nice. What, like, are you suggesting that, like, that'll be send it out and you'll get them in five to 10 years? Or, like, you'll be able to buy your own machine? Because that'd be crazy. Both. Like, I, like, I'd love it. I've, I've looked into buying a 3D printer. But again, I'm like, I don't have that technical skill to create things to print. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, if I could print steel, I might be interested in learning that a little better. Yeah. So we have That's like crazy. at work uh, at my normal work, we have a lot of aluminum printers, which is actually mm. one of the hardest metals to print, by the way, we have a lot of aluminum printers. And then we have, um, uh, there's a lot of Inconel printers because Inconel is so hard to machine. Um, they, there's, um, a lot of 3d printing for Inconel steel, you know, which is high temp steel. That's high hardness, high temp, uh, stuff that's very hard, basically any material that's very, very tough uh to machine they're saying okay well let's not machine it let's 3d print it instead 
because uh, it, it's a lot cheaper. Um, but that's slowly drifting to, hey, why don't we just 3D print anything? Um, sure. That's so, that's awesome. Yeah. The technology is coming along, and it, I don't think we'll ever be to the point where we can 3D print a blade. Um, hmm. Maybe, but not in the next 10 years, I don't think, because that's not the focus of the 3D printing world, right? Right. But, but handle parts and guard parts, absolutely. Um, yeah. Huh. Again, you can already get some now, um, but not easily. Uh, and again, I don't know if printed armory is even still going. I hope they are, but I did hear that they might have shut down due to COVID and all that stuff. Um, oh, boo. Yeah, I'm not yeah, entirely sure where they're at now. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully they're still going. I don't know. Yeah, hey, hopefully. if anyone watching knows, <laughs> please let us, let know, us know. Yeah. Uh, below. All right. Uh, on to our number ones. Yeah. Already? Oh, wow. I guess it's already been. Yeah, today's, today's falling by. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, it's good. Okay. One. Yeah. So, um, carvings, inlaying, anything of that nature, just very fine detail, all this fine, all this fine detail work. I don't know. That's the best word for it. <laughs> I'd love to get into. Um, that's just a time constraint realistically speaking from my perspective i'm just like if i'm gonna pull out a little chisel and a little hammer and i'm just gonna go to town i'd love to do it but i'm gonna have to have the time for it um so it is, yeah. it's an art form it's an art form and it would take like and i guess time i'm meaning like i will have to spend enough time learning how to do it before i can effectively use it so i'm just like it's crazy. I, I can't... The guys that sit there and just, like, chisel things out like that, I'm just like, that is so cool. I would love to do that on a piece. And so I've messed around with it with just, like, my cold-cut chisels and I'll sharpen them up and make little gouges out of them and whatnot. It is difficult, and I should definitely buy proper tools to actually try <laughs> this. <laughs> but it's really cool, and I'd love to get into this. Um Again, Chris, I'd love to hear your input. Have you done any of this? No. I, well, I can't say no. I have done some. A little um, bit. Okay. No, yeah. Nowhere near like the, I would point you towards uh, Ilya and Matt, you know, from um, I keep forgetting the name of their new channel. That works. I think is their new channel. That works. Okay. Uh, Ilya does a ton of carving work um, <clears throat> for inlays and stuff. Uh, I would recommend or look up Patrick Barda. Okay. Uh, and look at his work and all the inlay work. He, it's <laughs> it's amazing. What, what I love about all of this type of work, though, whether it's a carving or an inlay or, or anything, is it definitely makes the piece look a lot more historical. Um, because, well, I, I was going to say most historical. I can't really say most, but <clears throat> a lot of historical a lot. pieces, you can see the hand carvings and inlays, and, and it's it's amazing. I mean, that and that's something definitely... that is... Yeah, it's very ahead. underrepresented in pieces today. Yeah. Um, mainly because it's so time consuming. Yeah. So time consuming. Uh, yeah. What's crazy too, a lot of um so in Japanese blades, um Japanese blades that have fullers in them, especially, those fullers, you would think that they were either forged in or uh you know or ground in. Um, but almost all at least that I'm and, Hopefully someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe most historical Japanese and even modern day Japanese blade fullers are hand carved in. They're, oh, they're chiseled oh. in. They're not. Wow. Like, or really? they use that scraper and they scrape it in. I mean, that's got to oh take gosh. forever, but apparently yeah. it doesn't take that long. Um, I, uh, wow. So the guy, there's um, the makers who do. Um, Oh, I'm losing. I can't remember the name of the blade company now. It's a smaller blade company out of China. Um, I can't remember the name of them right now. But they, they make some great uh, katanas, and they make some Chinese blades as well. And, and mm. I, they show videos okay. of them hand carving out the fulos. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very cool. Yeah. No. So maybe I need to try hand carving some fullers too. Now I didn't yeah, even know that go. was a thing. Now that you've mm -hmm. said it, I'm interested. So yeah, it's very thing. Very big thing. That's awesome. Yeah, no, okay. definitely. And like you said too, like um, I'd love to. This is one of those skills that like I just don't think I have the precision work too, but I'd love to see more of and just out there. So, uh, Colton, when you're really good at it, let me know. <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll do. Um, yeah, so uh, let me send you some videos from Ilya, especially. Oh, I would so love he's that. made two. 
he's made two gorgeous blades for um uh what's the big blade show in atlanta is it just called blade show i forgot what it's called i don't know um, that, yeah, i don't know winter jack's cool to you oh i believe one of his desk. blades won uh you know uh blade of the year uh, okay i think it is called blade yes show. um that sounds right the amount of carving and inlays that he does on each of those blades and, and there's full videos of it oh and what's funny is i fast forward it and you see it because his little hammer and his little chisel it's a tiny little hammer because you don't yeah. want to put a lot of force on it no and he and he hits it a lot but when it, when they put it in fast forward it's like <laughs> it's really funny <laughs> to watch him do it. but the work is amazing um yeah, yeah i'll see if i can uh, send you the links to that okay yeah that'd be and great I think i'd it, love to see it pretty sure the channel is called that works and I apologies guys Matt nearly if I'm messing that up okay. I'm pretty sure that's what it is well right. there so. we go let's yes oh so moving on to the next yes is, uh, ah. so yeah um this is on our to-do list yeah yeah for sure and I think uh, <laughs> I want to say it's the last episode we kind of mentioned it um with the rapier you have but just finding ways to to weld uh, at the very least i know you have your rapier and just oh, we're talking it, about right? the the welds, so we're back there yeah <laughs> uh the weld marks and um kind of just like forming the basket around it and uh keeping it all clean like yours looks gorgeous but like you're pointing out the little no. things that <laughs> thank it <you>. does <laughs> it looks gorgeous in 1080 i'll judge yeah, it in it looks, person when i come out go. there oh it looks ho horrible uh <laughs> I mean, if, if you look at the inside, you can see how bad it looks. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you look, if you look under the hood, that hey, it still looks yeah. good. Give yeah. yourself credit. That's awesome. Um, this this one looks great. Uh, I'll, I'll, one that does look good is that one right there. You, <laughs> oh, can't get it in there. Dang it! I'm still not used to how the camera works. Oh, it's there so we weird. I hate it. See that one right there? We can see it. That, yeah, that yeah. one came out great. Like yeah. you can't even tell that's welded unless you get really close to it. But that's oh, yeah. one of the few that came out good. <laughs> so, but uh, the, the basket part, though, because so we have, um, you know, and, and the original baskets were welded, um, yeah. not welded in the sense that we think of welded sure. today. I don't know if you guys can hear my dogs, by the way. <laughs> Sorry if you can. <laughs> I can. Um, no, man, yeah, yeah. They want to get in. Um, but w we would essentially do it almost the same way today, whereas the whole thing's kind of cut and chiseled uh, out of a plate. Because you think of a Scottish basket, right. and then you form it around the hand from that plate. The original ones were done that way and just forge welded. So what we would be doing uh, is doing it very similar, but instead of forge welding, excuse me, we would be uh, either MIG welding or TIG welding it, and uh, yeah, and then cleaning up the welds. So yeah, and yeah, it's just like as a whole, just all the intricacies and <clears throat> in doing that, I'd love to do more of. Um, doing more designs like that um it's one of the things that i kind of like i've gotten into being one of the things i like doing is s docs and uh, small swords with um very normal guards and i'd like to kind of change that up and start moving into seeing if there's a way with more technique and more practice in putting together rapiers ourselves one day um at an affordable yeah, price because that's that's the thing that kills us right now it's just right. again the time constraints and how we do it we you know we can't do it affordably and i'd love to change that yeah there's got to be a way right right um, we just haven't thought of it yet yeah. yeah i thought arms and armor had thought of it <laughs> so i was talking to them because they they i think i can say this and i think almost everyone would agree in the sword world their reproduction rapiers i believe are the best and in, in, that you can get like any production rapier out there like doesn't really hold a a candle to arms and armors um hmm. again talking about production pieces uh not handmade pieces sure yeah but <laughs> i say that but there's pretty much our handmade um so i was asking them like hey i, I thought they casted those guards because they're so well done and, and the prices that they're putting out i was certain that they casted them but i was talking with nathan and chris at arms and armor uh and they were like nope <laughs> they're not cast uh there might be like individual parts that are cast but for the most part they're just like we do here they're the individual pieces are made and then welded together and I, i'm just like how are you charging so little <laughs> for that work? Right. and but they have a guy who's been doing it forever 
who is so quick with that work he can do it very quickly and and mm. uh, but yeah you know so i would say if you do one on an arms and armor rapier i think get one quick because i'm not sure um how much longer they're going to be doing them hopefully they'll, they'll keep doing them forever but that work is difficult and it's expensive work so i would not mm -hmm. be surprised to see their prices go up yeah uh, i'm yeah, surprised so I... they're as low as they are actually so but the basket though that we were talking about doesn't have nearly as many welds in it so that i think that we can do pretty reasonably uh um, all right but you know so... we'll see I mean that uh that cross guard I just sent you guys the other day. Um, I'm a little worried about the weight of it coming out heavier, but the original intent was to uh, weld weld it up and put a basket on it of some kind. Oh really? Um, Wait, so which one? The one that was laid? Yeah, the one that was laid. So it's like it's a little heavy. I it's I think it's slender, more slender. Yeah. In reason. person than it is in the photos, but. Um, I'd like to double ring up with the ring on the top and then kind of a oh, some yeah. kind of guard coming down around it. So not very intricate, but just add something to it in that nature. So essentially yeah. I need to do a blade for it first and then kind of get my specs and work off of that. Um yeah, that would be nice. Cause so, yeah, I haven't I haven't done much of this either, Thomas. So it's like <laughs> I messed with one, kind of yeah. okay, did another one, it was not that great. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm yeah. going to give this a solid try and see what I can come up with. So so two ring uh, long swords and complex hilted long swords and long messers or two handed falchions or Swiss sabers. Um, they're they're pretty darn popular. Um, mm. More and more people are asking for them, uh, mainly because a lot of the HEMA arts are starting to realize that, hey, most like a lot, especially a lot of the German treaties that we're studying are actually 16th century and up and not mm -hmm. earlier. <laughs> so when you're in 16th century, you're into complex guards for long swords and stuff. And a lot of folks aren't currently using this. Hmm. I actually had, um, so I did a laser cut of, of, I was hoping to do, I actually have it on the like, shop. I should have brought it in. Um, but it's a, a two ring long sword guard, hoping that I can, oh, I just, I'll just laser cut it, clean it up, put it on a sword. It would look beautiful. And <laughs> It just looks laser cut. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, it just doesn't look right. And then getting to clean up the insides of, of that guard is such a pain in the neck. It's almost yeah. not worth it. Yeah. Um, so enough. it's actually probably easier to make it our normal way and weld, uh, you know, a ring weld on both together. sides. Yeah. Because that way you can clean the insides before you weld it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I have done a... Weld after. Yeah, if you look on our Facebook page, you'll see, especially at Long Messers, there's a couple on there that have either single ring sides or double ring. Uh, I've done a couple of those. Um, and, and yeah, they look great when they're done. The, the, only, the other downside is, like, say we're going, you know, to a combat con or, or a, a ren fair to bring blades to sell. When, when your guard is complex, it's a lot harder, harder to, to pack. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's like there, oh, there it's right. the true. That's the true trade secret. Yeah, instead of fitting ten blades, there, I can it's, fit it's all about one. Shipping. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So it becomes a little bit of a of a pain. Uh, I mean, luckily, combat cons a drive for me. So yeah, yeah. Yep. I think we were talking. <laughs> so, the idea is that um, we were going to actually go to Josh. Yep. Uh, we're going to fly to you guys and drive over. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So no, that sounds good. Pretty cool. Carl, we'll have to rent a. Nice little van or something for all of us to fit in. <laughs> yeah. All of our stuff. A little RV. <laughs> That'd be cool. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Make a little road trip. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. yeah. That'd be awesome. We don't need to do worry about a hotel either. We just find a place to park and we camp out in the RV. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Cool. I guess I'll, I'll stay be in the, the hotel. Car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, last one. Oh, me. Oh, uh, so. Edge quenching. Uh, if you're not familiar with edge quenching, I was actually trying to find an image or something to show this, but uh, basically a lot of, if not most, historical blades were heat treated this way. So currently what we do for heat treating is, you know, you're, and I, what's funny is the timing of this. So this is filmed on the, the 30th. So this is March 30th. And this will probably won't release though till what, like mid April? No, no, I'm sorry, mid-March. Uh, end of April. Or end of April? So yeah, it's, it's going to be a while, but... First week, of, first week of May, end of April, first week of May, potentially. Yeah. But when we're filming this, uh, Arms and Armor, actually, Nathan from Arms and Armor just put out a 
an article on on edge quenching i think he called it mm. slack quenching um and i was like wow that, i saw it. he put it out i was like that's funny we're gonna talk about that <laughs> coming up on our sword talk nice. um but basically what it is so currently the way we heat treat stuff is you bring the uh so let's use a plate here so at the heat treat facility or you know wherever you're heat treating the entire blade gets brought up to a, like a yellow uh, red to yellow depending on the metal uh and then it's quenched in oil so the entire piece gets heat treated uh and then then you have to go back and retemper because uh, when you quench it it takes the entire uh structure of the whole blade up to its hardest point and then you put it in the temper oven for a couple hours to draw that hardness back out so that way you get your you know your springy you know <laughs> a weird way to do it but i don't know how to do it right now uh but you get your springy blade that's always going to return to true it's not too hard that it'll shatter like glass uh but it's kind of right in the middle that's your best yeah. sword blade well historically they didn't have these huge ovens and you know uh big vats of oil you know they uh for the most part so what they would do um is and, and also they didn't have propane for you know ovens yeah so yeah. they didn't have <laughs> even heat <laughs> i'll also say that so when they're heating up their blade they're using coal right or they're using some sort of coal type fire mm -hmm. and as they're running the blade in and out of and when if you've never worked with coal to get the a spot in the coal hot enough it's what you know you have to actually build what we call a hot pocket or a heat pocket where you build coal up into a pocket and that's where the heat is concentrated so it's not it's usually not a very big area of heat so because of that you're running your blade back and forth through that pocket of heat and what they do is they bring the so because your edges are thinner right they're going to heat up a lot faster um so the edges get really hot uh and they start glowing before the center of the blade starts heating up <clears throat> or starts getting that hot and then when this when the edges get hot enough to quench then they quench it like that and the rest of the steel hasn't got to that temperature to change structure yet. <clears throat> and the other thing they do is, is if the whole blade is a little warmer, uh, not only do the thin edges uh, heat up quicker, they also cool down faster, right? So when you quench it, they might be cooling down too quick. So what Nathan was talking about in the slack quenching is you quench it and then pull it immediately out. And the heat from the center, you can actually watch the heat from the center push back out to the edge. And that tempers it at the same time that you're quenching. Oh, my gosh. So it's one process. So the very first thing that I heat treated um, was a bunch of spear blades, which is also the same thing that Nathan was talking about. Um, so yeah, this is back when I, you know, the thing I talked about earlier with Edgar, I was 14, 15 years old. And he was showing me this whole process because that's how he did, did all of his knives and all of his tomahawks, which is what he was known for. And he would only, he would heat up the blade. So I basically hand forged out um a double-edged spear it looked like a, a short viking spear and uh, he walked me through the process and we heated and we were i think we were using 5160 um but yeah we, we and the base of that 5160 was thick it was almost half inch thick um before it tapered up to the edges so the edges got real hot you know glowing pretty quickly the center of that piece because it was so thick hadn't even started changing color yet he's like that's all right don't worry about it you just want your edges hard and so we would quench it <clears throat> and then when you pulled the the spear tip out of the quench you'd watch the heat from that center push back out to the edges and you can visually see it it was very cool and that was such a fun process and knowing that probably a lot of historical blades were actually done that way um it would just be a cool thing to do um yeah uh especially a cool thing to demonstrate at shows and stuff it'd be a lot of fun uh yeah. does it make a better sword blade no, <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, right. I, I can't say it'd be a, a worse sword blade, um, but it definitely wouldn't be as consistent uh, and springy uh, of a sword blade, uh, you know, than than a than a modern day you know, heat treat is. Um, but I, I just had such a fun time doing that process, and I love doing it. <clears throat> I think the biggest blade I ever did that with was probably about uh, it's probably about a 30, 31 inch arming sword blade. Almost like a Type 14 arming sword, so a very mm -hmm. wide base that narrowed out. <clears throat> but when we did that, the center fuller wasn't ground out yet, so we had all that mass in the middle, and then we did it that way, and then ground out the fuller afterwards. And you uh, know, when you look at a lot of historical blades, there is a differential heat treat in them. <clears throat> Sometimes the edges are a lot harder than the center, 
and they think that's that's why is because it was just it was edge quenched or slack quenched you know because hmm. yeah. they didn't have a better way to do it back then sure um, that's really cool that is really yeah cool. yeah it's very cool in fact i got so nerdy with it so this is probably my second or third year of college sure. <laughs> and in material science class we got so nerdy with it uh we took that a very similar spearhead to the first one i made and we actually hand calculated out the exact temperature, time and temperature, time and quench, and then time back in the air uh, to get the perfect uh, edge hardness and center hardness that we were looking for. And we had to hand calculate everything. And then actually we had a machine at USF, uh, my, my university, that could actually do the process and we could program it in um, and see how close our hand calcs matched what actually happened uh, you know, in, in doing the process and we got super close. We were like within like 10%. Oh, wow. it, <laughs> just doing that. was like, sadly the, the machine was very small, so you right. couldn't do a sword blade, but I was like, I want to do this as a sword blade. And I never got to that. So hmm. yeah, it was, it was pretty neat. That's very cool. So, that's really cool. Yeah. That's edge point. Actually, if you watch uh forge and fire, a lot of guys and they point it out every time somebody does it. Um, but a lot of guys in there do an edge quench because they know it's a better process for what they're trying to do. And every hmm. time they, somebody tries it, the judges all say, ah, oh, he knows what he's doing. He's edge quenching. <laughs> so, Very cool. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. yeah. And so um, uh, does that cover all of ours? We still I have think so. To run yeah. Real quick. So yeah, Chet had some good ones. Chets. Although, so Chet's and Colton's overlapped a bunch. So we did have <laughs> a little bit. Ones, though. So Chet, sorry you can't make it, but we're going to cover yours real quick. Yeah, so uh, uh, so Chet's first one or third one. So Let's gemstone inlays, over. similar to Colton's uh, inlays and and um, yep uh, carvings. Uh, gemstone yeah. inlays. So Kerry uh, at Baltimore Knife and Sword. I think it's his wife. I think Kerry. Sorry if I got that wrong. Um, but does a lot of gemstone inlays. And again, there's a lot of great videos uh, on that, and uh, that really makes a piece pop. You know, when, when you have oh, stones yeah. inlaid properly in a piece, I mean, it, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, that'd be fun to do. I, Would be. Um, yeah. Well, I've actually done a few in the past, but they weren't as good as, as theirs were because I'm not a jeweler. <laughs> so sure. it's the whole world of, of jewelry work and stuff, that's a whole nother type of, of metal work that's very different than sword making. Um, but it's a pretty cool world. So, what's the second one? Forging Damascus. Mm. Fun. Very fun. Very time consuming. <laughs> so, I'll say that. Well, the most annoying thing about the, uh, doing Damascus, by the way, so when I when I did mine, you, you can't, you, you really have to plan your blade out from the beginning, right? You have to know exactly where you want your twist, how you want your shapes, and you got to know how you're going to do your fi final grind on the piece. Um, because you want to make sure your twists are in the right spot. <laughs> so when I first did it, I wasn't thinking that far ahead, right? I was like, oh, it's cool. I'm doing Damascus. And um, well, I, I guess it really depends on the type of Damascus that you're doing. But so we were doing twisted bar, welded together, uh, <clears throat> uh, forged flat, you know, that, that style. But I wanted to put a fuller in the blade. And the guy that was helping me out was like, I don't think you want to do a fuller. You're going to kill the entire pattern. And I was like, oh, are you, are you sure? So the blade ended up being super heavy because I couldn't fuller hmm. it out because if you did fuller it out, you kill the Damascus pattern. Um, so for that particular one. So yeah, you really got to plan everything out ahead of time. And it, it's a lot of planning it, for those of guys who know how to do it. They can do it really quickly. Sure. And it, and again, that's an art form. Um, oh yeah, for sure. But yeah, you can get some pretty cool looking pieces, especially like a lot of the mosaic stuff we're doing. I, I know. Um, so again, that's another thing. <laughs> I keep saying Matt Nilly a lot, this video. Um, but they do a lot of the, or they have done mosaic Damascus pieces before just to show off what they can do. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's all amazing stuff. I, yeah. I haven't touched, I actually haven't done that in probably 15 years. So <laughs> it's been a while. Never done it. So yeah, that is very cool. Oh, if you yeah, go to the sure. hammer in, uh, they'll probably have some folks doing it there. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to. I'm going to be honest. Like, I'm that weird odd thing. Like, I, I love the concept of Damascus from, like, uh, the Fortune's perspective, but, like, I'm, yeah. I 
don't actually like the look of Damascus. Oh, you don't? Yeah. I, it, I do not. I don't either, honestly. It depends on the piece. I mean, like, in a knife blade, yeah. it can be cool, but, like, a full sword or something in Damascus, I'm not oh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. a fan of. Um, the only sword ones I'm a fan of are the... It's not really Damascus, um, but it's the... Uh, what you call it? The original... What they thought was Damascus, um, hmm. but it's just the vanadium bands that separate out in heat treat. Um, I don't know why I'm forgetting the name of this, but it's what original what they thought Damascus was. They thought it was multi metals being forged together, but it wasn't. Um, Woots, there you go. Woots Damascus. That stuff is very cool. And what, what that is is it looks like Damascus, and it looks like multiple steels forge welded, but it's actually not. In Woots Damascus. Uh, it's a special material with a high percent of vanadium and molybdenum in it. And when you heat treat it a certain pattern, the vanadium and the molybdenum uh, start migrating out in bands that look like tree bark. And so it looks like Damascus. Hmm. Um, but it's not. It's just a different type huh. of... Uh, yeah, well, that's cool. Yeah. Yep. So the old school, you know, Persian blades that were considered, you know, that all the stories were chopping through rifle barrels and stuff, the crazy <laughs> stuff they're... That, that's sure. Woods Damascus, yeah. Gotcha. So a different Crazy. animal altogether, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what are you doing? Yeah. What's his number one? Number one. Cast oh, yeah. <laughs> casting parts. Yeah, casting we talked about that already. Covered that. Uh, so, yeah, casting parts opens up a whole world, right? We don't have that now. Um, so if you get a piece from us, you'll know everything's hand done. Uh, that's a good thing. The downside right. is we are limited in, in what we can do because we can't cast anything and uh yeah or we don't cast anything uh, we could cast things it's just expensive for us because we don't do big runs of pieces so mm -hmm. um Maybe. yeah i think that's in our future at some point especially yeah, Brian. Sure. i think i think with uh, all of the different hands we have now like the, the idea of things like casting and all the different types of uh work that we want to do it's kind of like giving us the inspiration to do it right like kind mm -hmm. of forcing us to push forward with these ideas. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And the cool thing is, so <laughs> if you're a maker out there watching this, you guys know that as makers, if you're doing the same thing all the time, it gets boring and you start mm -hmm. to lose motivation for doing that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're always looking for new ways and new <clears throat> things and new designs and, and new ways to make designs all the time. And that's what keeps this hobby interesting. And that's what keeps, you know, making blades interesting. I say hobby, but it's more than that for all of us, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so all of these things that we're talking about are, are on our list. And, uh, you know, if you have um, a design or, or, if you, or if you know things about these particular topics that we've been talking about, uh, let us know. Like, again, we all come from different backgrounds. So, like, a big difference in us, our backgrounds, like Colton's a machinist, right? So he hasn't done forging before. But I, I wish I had his <laughs> machining experience because... Right he's so good with the machining stuff it's, it's amazing um so you know just different backgrounds coming together to make uh great stuff and uh i think we're all going to learn from each other and, and, and keep on going uh, well i mean i'd like to interject into that uh calling me a machinist is a little glorifying my role here i oh. run machinery <laughs> That's i don't a run, i don't run cncs or anything like that i've got a lathe i've got a mill and i can i can do pretty good on it but that makes to you be a more of a machinist. Yeah. Okay. And the guy okay. pushing the button on the CNC. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I don't know. It feels too glorified to call me a machinist. Uh, <laughs> I would say you are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. More so than the rest of us. So, I'll take uh, it. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't seen it, so go to Copper Thorn. You can see his, his pieces there. Yeah. It's amazing. So Colton's shown us some of his pieces and they're, they're awesome. Um, oh, thank you. I'm, yeah, I, I love the, what I've seen you've gotten so far. And I'm, I'm excited to see some big swords. Oh, I'm so yeah, excited yeah, sure. to move into big swords. Um, I mean, like that. So that's that's one of my very first ones, and I actually revisited it when revisited it. That doesn't seem like I said that right. Um, <laughs> it's one of those weird <laughs> words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Revisited it. Did it. Cheers. Um, <laughs> it, it, it. I'm not drunk. Oh, I'm not. Drunk. <laughs> yeah. I'm not Why is the rum gone? Yeah, I gotta switch bottles because I'm out of that one. <laughs> so 
that was one of my very first ones that I made. And then I met Warbear and he was just like, dude, what are you doing? Like, grind these yeah. blades better, make this lighter, make it <laughs> Josh just wanted to talk. Yeah, and I know, so, right? <laughs> hey, Josh well, is no, telling no, no. others. <laughs> Josh was telling me to make it lighter is telling you how heavy that thing was. So it's eight pounds. Oh yeah, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I think it's like five and a half, and I've brought Oof. it down to maybe four and a half. But the design of it would just get lost yeah. if I keep. Did I tell you it. I've made one of those, like, um, to print to the original? Of one of these, long claw. That's long claw, right? It is not. Oh, I'm sorry. It looked like a long. It's claw just my background. own. I was like, wait, what are you talking about? That's mine. <laughs> yeah. I, sorry, I'm, I'm looking. Sorry, let me scoot out of the way. I can't yeah. zoom in. So from, go- from my point of view, it looked like Longclaw from Game of Thrones. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I don't... But yeah, it's totally not. It looked like it was. Um, so I'm totally inspired. Uh, we're totally getting off on a tangent. We're already well past our hour. Yeah. My <laughs> favorites okay. My favorites are Lord of the Rings. So I kind right. of combined Narsil with a bit of Glamdring and then the, um, the uh, oh my gosh, I can't think of Nazgul blades where it's got that wider blade that comes down and then Oh, dips yeah. in yeah so i was kind of like let's just throw to it all together floor? say what is that hard no to it's easy i just can't reach because i got just a second yeah, yeah. yeah go grab it <laughs> get resituated here and then i'll have to do my backwards videoing yeah so oh um, cool. yeah that looks totally different wow. than what i thought it was <laughs> yeah so it's Close uh, up, it's different Wow, that's like... You f- and you fullered that out? Uh, yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So, yeah, this is one of my first. Um, it did not look this good the first time I finished it. I've, <laughs> I've gone back in. I've learned better techniques. This was this was like eight years ago, give or take. That's still amazing. Um, So, super heavy. It's not terribly balanced, shall we say. It's kind of just... It's wow. right in here. It's yeah. maybe even a little close, but... Mild steel Close, blade. Yeah. Um, oh, really? I was gonna. Ask oh yeah, you. no. Like if I hit anything with this, it's breaking. It's just kind of a little rat tail through here. It's threaded. Oh, really? on. It looks okay. <laughs> I forgive you. If you. It's great to hang on the wall. It's great yeah. to hang on the wall, and I'm very proud of it because it's one of my firsts. So yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. But I mean, it looks amazing. Yeah. Now, I think we I mean, should like... remake that in a as a real blade. Oh, Absolutely. I would love you... to. I would yeah. love to have one of these in good in materials, real. good process. I'd love yeah. one. That so someday, next project. it'll be yeah. it'll be great. Yeah, <laughs> I don't awesome. remember why we got on that tangent. Uh, machining uh, and, and talking about yeah, yeah, we were talking about your machining, yeah. and okay. you wanted to move into big blades, big yeah. blades. And, and I mentioned, so I thought it was long claw, and it wasn't. Mm, <laughs> so. yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, again, cool. yeah. There you go. Awesome, I'll, but it's I'm definitely just stuff like that, like. Yeah, it's no stuff problem. like that, like just the inspirations that make us want to keep doing this and learning all these different techniques. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's great too is so like you know I, I'm a lot of my inspiration is uh, a lot of the historical pieces from museums all over that I got a chance to study, mm-hmm. but having that as a polar opposite to, to Josh and Colton's and, and some of the other guys who their inspiration is Lord of the Rings or or fantasy genre, but. That's also awesome blades and trying to merge those together mm-hmm. ends up being Definitely. very cool. Uh, so yeah, that's why I love our different backgrounds. And I think all the stuff that we can put out because of that yeah. uh, is, is pretty fantastic. So oh, I, I definitely agree. Definitely yeah. agree. Alrighty. Well, we are at almost an hour 20. So yeah. I thought this was going to well, be a short one today. Oh, it was a good uh, Yeah, we, we talked about it. Yeah. Then, yeah. <laughs> so um uh, no, they're wrong yeah thanks uh if you've been with us this long if you watched the whole thing thank you for for <laughs> staying with us uh, i know this is a different topic uh us makers nerding out over maker things um uh hope you know hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, if you have any topics for us below uh you know please uh post them let us know um and uh let's do a quick uh before we head out let's everyone just a reminder of where we can find everybody uh, so start with Colton. Uh, Copperthorn Customs on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Awesome. Yep. Can... Yep. And then Thomas and I. <laughs> yeah, you can find me speak on for uh, you. Sterling <laughs> Armory. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, Chris can speak because yeah. I, I don't do the social media thing. Um, yeah. Find We're me. trying to get Congratulations. Thomas. 
It's surprising because he is our best tech guy. He's he's helping the stream. <laughs> That's right why you can't find me because I know about tech. <laughs> That's right. I'm I'm like um, that IT guy who's like running on like an old printer that you have to like crank to get the paper through. Yes. I don't actually have a computer. I have a typewriter because right. I don't actually trust technology. I just know how to use it. That's uh, yeah. me. Yeah. We should all be learning, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, yeah. So both of us are on Sterling Armory. If you're on, if you're watching this, you you know our YouTube page, Sterling Armory at YouTube. Um, but we will link our Facebook page below, along with Colton's information below as well. Um, yeah, and thanks for joining us. us. You'll find most of us at ComebackCon this year in Vegas yes. in July. Yeah, I think it's end of July at the moment. I want to say it's like 21st, 22nd. I don't know, but so yeah, we'll, ComebackCon. Next episode, we'll have more accurate dates, and that way we can tell <laughs> uh, people exactly hopefully. when to find us. Yeah, <laughs> so, hopefully. Okay. The dates are announced. We know what they are. Yeah. I just don't remember what they are. We just don't have it on our list right now. But yeah, if you can get out and see us in person, we'll all be there, which would be great. Um, yeah. And uh, you know what else I forgot? I forgot closing remarks again. <laughs> so, oh, hey. <laughs> you got, uh, anyone got one? Anyone got a good, funny closing? Uh, you know, it's always good to go with a classic. Yeah. Uh, remember, yeah. keep your peens clean. clean. Yeah, this was a maker episode. So if you guys makers, sword makers, you know, keep your peens clean. Peep, keep right. them clean. And polish your nuts. Yep. Oh, hey, there you go. There's another one. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not Warbear. I'm not uh, no, clever. Nobody's <laughs> Warbear, man. That guy right. and his like, words. Like, yeah. our, our efforts combined don't even make up a fraction of that man's mental By capacity. Our powers nope. combined. Yeah, no, not even a tad. Yeah. You need to get him out here. Like, you're a tree. All right. You're a tree. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Yeah, oh, right. make sure to watch our house made videos as well. Yep. Definitely. And anything else we're posting. So all right. Like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> oh yeah, like comment, all, subscribe. all those things. Yep. All right. We'll jump off now. Thanks, guys. All right, all right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>